Professor Chomsky is here. Okay, let's hear from Professor Noam Chomsky. My wife, Valeria, and I are very pleased to be able to join you for this. Uh, try this again. How's this? Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, I just said that uh, my wife, Valeria, who's here, and I are very pleased to be able to join you for this uh, most significant event uh, at the invitation of our friend Salso Amorim. Uh, we, uh, though our concerns here are far broader, I'm sure that all of us have in the back of our mind the striking problem of democracy in Brazil. The, uh, uh, we cannot overlook uh, the uh, being concerned with the person who should by rights be the next president of Brazil. Uh, I, was, I had the privilege uh, 20 years ago of meeting Lula before he was elected, spent several days with him, was very much impressed, and uh, uh, have uh, retained uh, those impressions over the years. Uh, our concerns, as I said, are far broader, and I'll turn to that. Uh, uh, there is now, of course, uh, considerable concern about the state of democracy in uh, much of the world, uh, very realistically. Uh, we don't have to look very far from where we're meeting to see a striking illustration. Uh, there are others uh, quite a distance from here. Uh, one is the uh, election that just took place in Sweden a few days ago. It extended a pattern of uh, recent years in which the centrist institutions uh, have seriously declined or collapsed, and extremist parties of the far right have gained, uh, all of which uh, evokes grim memories, certainly of someone my age can remember the 30s all too well. Uh, the uh, ominous uh, results in Sweden are generally attributed to recent immigration and the bitter reaction to it. Uh, that is the routine interpretation of similar phenomena over much of the world. Uh, but it's uh, much of the West, certainly. But it's useful always to be wary about conventional wisdom. And uh, that turns out to be true in this case as well. Uh, there was a very interesting study that just came out by five prominent Swedish economists which reveals a deeper reason for the gains of what had been a small, xenophobic, uh, far-right party with neo-Nazi roots. Uh, their study shows quite convincingly that the sharp increase in votes from the far right came from sectors that had little contact with immigrants, but that had suffered the effects of the neoliberal policies of the Swedish government in recent years. 
uh, people who had been left out uh, as inequality sharply rose and who felt uh, quite rightly that they had been abandoned by the political organizations. Uh, very much the same is true in uh, neighboring Finland. Uh, there, a radical right party made gains uh, shortly after painful spending cuts by the government. Uh, this is a country with only minuscule amounts of immigration. Immigration is not an issue. And actually, similar conclusions hold for the United States, for Britain with regard to Brexit, and uh, in fact, much more generally. The uh, deep recession of 2008, with its uh, catastrophic impact on the general population, I'll now quote, uh, peeled away the facade and revealed an anger that had been building for decades. I'm quoting the chief economist of uh, one of the world's major financial firms, who added that the crisis was horrific, but its legacy pushed us over the edge in terms of the discontent, which had been building for decades, uh, ever since the onset, onset of the neoliberal assault uh, a generation ago. And uh, people who are cast aside by social and economic policies and who see a bleak future for themselves and their children uh, quite naturally feel resentment and anger and fear. And it's all, so, all too easy for such feelings to be transmuted into a search for scapegoats, uh, commonly those who are even more vulnerable. Now that's particularly true among populations that have been atomized by policies uh, that are aimed at undermining the social order, uh, policies guided by uh, Margaret Thatcher's uh, famous maxim that there is no society, uh, only individuals. It's incidentally, her unwitting paraphrase of Karl Marx, uh, who bitterly condemned the authoritarian rulers of Europe for trying to turn society into a sack of potatoes, uh, an amorphous mass of isolated people who confront concentrated power alone. That a crisis of democracy should result from this is uh, hardly a surprise. And uh, pursuing these thoughts further, uh, we may recall that the neoliberal policy term was adopted uh, in the wake of another perceived crisis of democracy. Uh, that phrase, in fact, is the title of an important publication by the Trilateral Commission, its first publication. Uh, this was in 1975. It's a group of distinguished liberal internationalists drawn from the three centers of capitalist democracy, uh, Europe, uh, Japan, and the United States. And the crisis of democracy that they perceived was that the popular activism of the 1960s was bringing too much democracy. Normally, passive and obedient parts of the population were organizing, uh, entering the political arena to advance their demands. Uh, the young, the old, uh, women, uh, workers, farmers, uh, in short, the general population who, uh, according to liberal democratic theory, are, I'm quoting now, ignorant and meddlesome outsiders who must be put in their place as spectators, not participants, while the intelligent minority of responsible men rule in the interests of all. Actually, I'm quoting the uh, renowned, most renowned US public intellectual of the 20th century, uh, Walter Lippmann, uh, quote, you know, Wolf, Wilson Roosevelt uh, Kennedy liberal, uh, quoting his, uh, what are called his progressive essays on democracy. Uh, 
the American uh, rapporteur in the trilateral study, uh, Harvard uh, University uh, professor of the science of government, uh, Samuel Huntington, uh, he uh, reminisced nostalgically about the days when, as he put it, President Truman had been able to govern the country with the cooperation of a relatively small number of Wall Street lawyers and bankers so that true democracy flourished, no crisis. Uh, but that was before the activism of the 1960s that threatened to shatter these uh, comfortable arrangements. Well, the remedy to the crisis of democracy, the scholars concluded, was what they called more moderation in democracy uh, and much harsher conditions on what they called the institutions responsible for the indoctrination of the young. Now, the schools, the universities, they were simply not doing their job. They were failing to train students in good order passivity, obedience, uh, silence. Uh, on the, that's on the left liberal side of the spectrum. On the right, uh, similar concerns were voiced, uh, but in far harsher terms than these. Uh, the business world felt uh, under severe threat by militant labor actions. Uh, young workers were uh, demanding not just benefits, but even more control of the workplace. The Lordstown strike was one example. And uh, declining rates of profit uh, exacerbated these fears. Uh, that's a large part of the background for the abandonment of what was called the regimented capitalism of the post-war period. It's called in Europe the Trente Glorieuse in the United States, uh, the golden age of capitalism uh, with the most sustained growth in history and uh, relatively egalitarian growth, uh, offering opportunities that were being exploited by the ignorant and meddlesome outsiders who are supposed to be spectators, not participants in the political process. And a very natural response uh, to these dangers was to shift policy to business-friendly policies, adopting uh, the religion that the market knows best, uh, borrowing the withering uh, condemnation by former World Bank chief economist, uh, Nobel laureate Joseph Stiglitz, who was one of the few dissenters to the new orthodoxy. Well, from the perspective of the designers of the system, the neoliberal programs, uh, they were led by the United States, but very soon adopted elsewhere, uh, these have been quite successful. A tiny percentage of the population has enjoyed spectacular gains, uh, while the majority uh, stagnated or declined. Uh, the U.S. government uh, also changed the rules of corporate governance in ways that allowed executive compensation to soar by a thousand percent since 1978, while real, work, uh, real wages, at the actual wages adjusted for inflation for non-supervisory workers have actually declined since 1979, since before the Reagan-Thatcher onslaught began. Uh, the uh, uh, financial uh, unions have been subjected to bitter attack, important way to turn society into a sack of potatoes. Uh, there's been a combined offensive for of state and the state and private capital, closely linked, of course. Uh, financial institutions have exploded in scale, uh, also changing very sharply in uh, their function. They changed from serving the real economy to speculation uh, risk. Uh, uh, they actually reached 40% of corporate profits in the United States before the 2008 crash, uh, for which they were 
largely responsible. Uh, deregulation uh, led at once uh, to financial crises beginning in the Reagan years. Uh, each one is more severe than the last. But that's no problem at all for the perpetrators who are handsomely rewarded, uh, handsomely supported by the taxpayer. Uh, that's not just the highly publicized bailouts, which actually greatly anger the population, uh, but also by more subtle means, which aren't easily perceived, such as access to cheap credit, uh, inflated credit rankings, uh, uh, the knowledge that you can take uh, risky transactions which are high profitable with no concern, uh, all because of the tacit government insurance policy, uh, what's called too big to fail. So you can do what you like. And actually, the IMF, the IMF had an interesting study of the six largest American banks a couple of years ago in which they concluded that virtually their entire profits derived from the tacit government insurance policy. Uh, the socioeconomic achievements have been accompanied by doctrinal constructions that are of considerable moment. And uh, to see how far elite ideology has shifted to the right during the neoliberal years, it's useful to look back to what was considered conservatism, deep conservatism, a few years earlier. Uh, for example, the views of President Eisenhower. I remember very well in 1952 when he was elected, I and my friends thought that was the end of the world. This uh, ultra-reactionary is coming into office. Well, here are some of his views. Uh, Eisenhower declared, I'm quoting him, I have no use for those, regardless of their political party, who hold some foolish dream of spinning the clock back to days when unorganized labor was a huddled, almost helpless mass. Only a handful of unreconstructed reactionaries harbor the ugly thought of breaking unions. Only a fool would try to deprive working men and women of the right to join the union of their choice. Should any political party attempt to abolish Social Security, unemployment insurance, uh, to eliminate labor laws and farm programs, you would not hear of that party again in our political history. There's a tiny splinter group, of course, that believes that you can do these things. Among them are a few Texas oil millionaires and an occasional politician or businessman from other areas. Their number is negligible and they are stupid. That's conservatism in the 1950s. Well, they may be negligible in total numbers, but they're far from stupid. And their triumph is quite impressive, including both of the major political parties in the United States, and indeed much of the intellectual culture quite broadly. Uh, today, uh, Bernie Sanders is described as a revolutionary, radical revolutionary, far off the political spectrum uh, for voicing uh, beliefs that Eisenhower would have found so normal that you hardly have to say them. Tell us a lot about the neoliberal triumph in the intellectual, political, economic domains. Uh, the the uh, achievements of the neoliberal economy uh, greatly impressed elite opinion. Uh, that included, uh, crucially, the economics profession, uh, which hailed the what they called the great moderation and very confidently assured the public that recessions are a thing of the past, and now that uh, sophisticated market theories uh, from the University of Chicago and elsewhere are able to keep inflation under control and to ensure a steady growth, admittedly, uh, for a tiny percentage of the population. Uh, the master of the economy, uh, Fed, Fed, Federal Reserve Chief Alan Greenspan, 
It was actually called St. Al Saint Alan, regarded as one of the great economists of the ages. Now, that was before the whole structure collapsed in a shambles uh, that would have become probably worse than the Great Depression had not very drastic actions been taken to rescue the economy. Well, while he was still basking in glory, uh, St. Alan instructed Congress uh, that the success, his success in managing the flourishing economy uh, was based on what he called growing worker insecurity. Uh, as he explained, uh, workers are so intimidated that even when formal employment is low, they're afraid to seek uh, better wages and benefits so that there's no inflationary pressure. And uh, though this is not mentioned, uh, profits can be sky high. I should say that in the, in the English language, the word profits has become a four-letter word, which you can't pronounce. There's a euphemism that you use uh, to replace it. It's jobs. So when somebody, politician says, I'm working for jobs, that's, you have to translate that. Uh, well, that was, St. Alan uh, gave those instructions uh, during the late 90s. That was a temporary boom, soon led to a bust, though nothing, nothing like the crash of 2008. As you know, it was caused by predatory lending for homes and complex financial in instruments to uh, obscure the sheer robbery, uh, all thanks to uh, deregulation, which in fact was pursued by the liberal economists, Larry Summers of Harvard and others. Uh, when the crash came, Congress passed legislation that had two parts. Uh, the first part was to bail out the perpetrators uh, those who were responsible for the crisis and ended up uh, richer, more powerful than before. And the second part of the legislation was to help the homeowners who were devastated by the crash. And it's important to remember that for most of the population, homeownership is the source of personal wealth. When you hear about the stock market ri rising now, a wonderful economy, that's a small percentage of the population. For most of the population, it's homes. They have, haven't reached anything like what they were before the crash. And for African Americans, it's actually down to approximately zero in wealth. Now, that's not in the headlines, but that's in the background. Well, uh, those were the two parts of the legislation uh, anyone who understands the logic of modern capitalism can predict easily uh, which of the two prongs was implemented. Uh, it was uh, a giveaway to Wall Street executives, to quote the bitter condemn condemnation by the uh, special inspector general of the bailout program, Neil Borofsky, who was appalled at the way a policy was implemented given the legislation. But again, quite predictable in the age of savage neoliberal capitalism. Well, the consequences of all of this may not be known in detail by the ignorant and meddlesome outsiders, but they can readily grasp what's happening. In the United States, their uh, anger and uh, resentment has made them easy prey to a confidence man who pretends to be their defender against the hated elites, uh, but meanwhile provides cover uh, for policy decisions that undermine them at every turn. It's quite amazing to watch. If you look at it in detail, it's impressive. Now, the prime example of this is the most prized achievement of the Trump administration, uh, the tax bill that uh, Joseph Stiglitz uh, accurately called the U.S. Donor Relief Act of 2017. Uh, the uh, bill lavishes huge gifts 
on the very wealthy in the corporate sector, virtually nothing for anyone else, and it brings an extra benefit. It creates a huge deficit. And the purpose of this was very cheerfully explained by the architect of the program, Paul Ryan, uh, to deal with the deficit, he explained, it's necessary to sharply reduce the meager social spending for the general population, uh, health, uh, education, food support for the poor, uh, other such uh, irrelevancies of the neoliberal era. Important to note as well that though the United States is by far the most, the richest, most uh, country in history, uh, enormous advantages in social justice measures in the, among the OECD countries, the rich countries, it ranks way down at the bottom along with Greece and Turkey. Well, the growing worker insecurity that Greenspan lauded as the basis for a healthy economy is enhanced by the nature of employment in the neoliberal period. Uh, increasingly, the economy is designed to create a precarious existence, uh, uh, to create uh, a new precariat, <coughs> as the growing mass of victims are sometimes called. It's an interesting recent study by two prominent labor economists, uh, Lawrence Katz, Alan Kruger. Uh, they find, I'm quoting them, that 95% of the employment growth in the US economy from 2005 to 2015 appears to have occurred in alternative work arrangements, part-time, temporary, uh, irregular, few employer commitments, individual arrangements, uh, all in all a uh, fine way to reduce society to a sack of potatoes, but also a toxic mixture that can erupt in dangerous ways as we're seeing throughout the world. Well, the beneficiaries of the neoliberal reaction uh, commonly call themselves libertarians. It's a phrase that would have impressed George Orwell. Uh, in practice, that means cutting services for the general population, while huge subsidies are lavished on agribusiness, finance, uh, energy, other major industries, uh, sometimes directly, sometimes indirectly, so they're not so easily seen. So take, for example, Amazon, which just became the second trillion dollar corporation after Apple. Uh, it had already benefited greatly from exemption from sales taxes. And the business press now reports, I'm quoting them, that Amazon uses 2% of US electricity at sharply reduced rates, following a long US tradition of shifting costs from businesses to poor residents who already pay about three times more of their income on utility bills than do wealthy households. That's called libertarianism. Uh, concentration of wealth, enhancement of corporate power, translate automatically to decline of democracy. The means are too familiar to review. Uh, research in uh, mainstream academic political science reveals that a large majority of the population of voters are literally disenfranchised. Uh, their own representatives pay no attention to their views. Uh, they listen to the voices of the donor class and furthermore, it's well established that elections in the United States, the prime democracy of the world, elections are pretty much bought. Uh, electability, hence policy, is predictable with remarkable precision uh, from the single variable of uh, finance comp camp uh, campaign spending. From that alone, you can predict electability almost perfectly, both for the executive and for Congress. And that's a bare beginning. Uh, legislation is commonly shaped by corporate lobbyists, uh, well represented, in fact, often written by them, 
while representatives who sign the legislation have their eyes on funding for the next election. In Europe, in many ways it's even worse. A combination of austerity policies and flaws in European Union governance exacerbate these problems. It's no secret that the basic socioeconomic policies of the EU are set by the unelected Troika, European Commission, Central Bank, the IMF, of course, with the northern banks uh, looking over their shoulders and making sure it comes out the right way. And the resentment against uh, formal democratic institutions uh, comes as very little surprise. Well, just to conclude, there are, however, many bright spots that relieve the general malaise. Uh, all over the world, uh, lively, energetic, popular movements are arising, uh, working hard for a sharp reverse reversal of the dismal course of recent years. And in addition to that, achievements of the recent past uh, provide their own powerful lessons and inspiration uh, dramatically right here in Brazil. A century ago, uh, Brazil was recognized to be the potential colossus of the South, a term that was used by analysts. And that goal was in sight only a few years ago when Brazil became perhaps the most respected country in the world under the leadership of President Lula, Foreign Minister Celso Amorim with impressive achievements at home as well, which is an indication of what is, with, what is within reach and can be surpassed. Uh, one should never underestimate the obstacles that lie ahead, nor the capacity of the human spirit uh, to overcome and to prevail. Thank you, Professor Chomsky, for your words. I will now turn the floor to Kalteman Cardenas to make his remarks. Before anything, I would like to share with you the fact that yesterday I had the privilege, we had the privilege, as Massimo Galema mentioned this morning, to visit our dear friend and companion, President Lula. And I would like to tell you that some friends before the visit had told me that uh, we would possibly find him a bit depressed for having uh, renounced uh, a few days before his candidature because of uh, that uh, aggressive uh, limiting of his rights by the Brazilian state. But what we found was someone uh, that, uh, in fact, raised our spirits and uh, made us see that he continues uh, a fighter and that he continues ahead this uh, fight uh, of the Brazilian people to put an end to the current situation and the current administration. And I would like to tell you that President Lula was very happy that uh, we would be able to attend the seminar. It is something that uh, I could not fail to tell you before I started uh, talking about what I came here to. As you know, in Mexico, we just went through an electoral process which was very different from all others we had been through before. 
we had a very high level of uh, votes in terms of uh, social participation. And in what people understood in favor of uh, a proposal from the left which poses a change in the Mexico situation. And that will certainly reverberate in the rest of the continent, and especially the southern part of our continent. In the Mexican campaign, uh, the winning campaign had as its main proposal that they would eradicate and fight against corruption, corruption and impunity that have characterized uh, the previous administrations of Mexico, I would say the last uh, almost 40 years, particularly the, less, the latest one, which is about to conclude its administration in two months from today. Uh, this uh, administration is certainly the less supported that we had uh, in many, many years. And it was the administration that succeeded to create uh, the most animosity in the population. And that somehow explains the results of the election now. Uh, several uh, parties and several groups, even those that were part in this campaign, talked about the need to fight corruption as their priority, that fight poverty, decrease inequalities, and deeply fight uh, the narco-traffic and uh, crime in general. But I believe the only way we can really solve these problems is by going to the root of these problems. And the root is not in corruption, per se, that could be seen by an isolated uh, event by corrupt people or in inequality or because the latest policies that were enforced in Mexico were uh, socially excluding and concentrating uh, wealth and generated violence and everything, but rather because what we need is to change the model of policies that uh, is used in Mexico. Mexico, I think similarly to other countries in the continent, have uh, enforced quite strictly policies that are uh, imposed or suggested or by neoliberalism by uh, consensus, uh, of Washington consensus. And that led to the fact that after a long period of more than 40 years of growth, sustainable growth, improvement, and development, without, of course, we had deviations and we had setbacks in the past, but at least for a good many years, the, Brazil, the country was uh, developing and moving on. However, after the new liberal policies, what we saw is that we went to from a growth of GDP of about 6% a year in 40 years to levels of in the first uh, years of uh, 2.5, 1, 1.5%. These are very steep uh, drops, 94, 95, and then in 2008, when we had uh, 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 a, a more than minus 7% uh, uh, growth rates in the country. So more than 50% of the population, 53, 54% of the Mexican population now is in poverty. 20% uh, is what we call food poverty. And as I mentioned, we had an extremely low growth with a huge concentration of wealth. 
And we can see in the Gini index, for instance, that it is at 65.67, which shows a huge concentration of wealth in our country. And on the other side, a dismantling of the economy that uh, somehow drove the growth of the country. All kinds of privatization, um, companies, corporations that were strategic for the country, and an abandonment of an industrialization policy. Um, is, is uh, like the automotive in the air sector with some technological advances in this area, but uh, with a loss of quality in education and a decrease and a deterioration of the welfare system. And finally, in this administration, what we had were what were called structural reforms. The structural reforms were first a reform in education, which was not really uh, uh, an education reform. It was a labor reform that affected the rights of those workers in education. Uh, the reform basically had as its objective democratizing the means of communication. But uh, in fact, what they did is that uh, they started to pass secondary laws that were retrocess, uh, removing privileges in the country and uh, keeping privileges to some median consortia. So it was a reform in communication that really failed, and a labor reform that attacked the rights of workers. And even more worrisome, what we call the energy reform, which made the country lose constitutionally the power of the state over its energy resources. Again, with all that, there was a complete deterioration of the oil industry, which was the industry that uh, led the growth of our economy and the industrialization process. And little by little, it was dismantled. And so today, we have a situation in which we are just uh, giving away our resources and just uh, opening up for new exploitation of our resources uh, from 3.5 million oil bearers in the 2000, 2003, 2004, we now have a bit less than 1.8, 1.9 million. So we no longer invest in oil drilling. We no longer invest uh, in petrochemistry. Investments were reduced dramatically. And what we have now is basically all our possibilities in the near and in the not so near future is just given way to the large international oil consortium. So it started with, uh, with the control of resources and according to our constitutional reform, the underground uh, oil is, belongs to the state, but once it is drilled, it no longer is uh, the, under the control of the state. And we have other situation that uh, really struck me. It was in what uh, Marilena said this morning, because we had quite a lot 
of uh, aggressiveness from extractive uh, industries. Well, the country has mining companies in the third part of the national territory. I'm talking about 300,000 square meters. And I'm talking about mining companies that have displaced communities, uh, indigenous communities, um, rural communities, and also caused very serious environmental damages to the areas. And the state does nothing about it. Uh, 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 in the United States, uh, Canada, we have a free trade agreement. Uh, these companies do not pay any taxes on exports. And uh, what mining companies are being paid in this case would be about between half dollar to five, six dollars per hectare of what they are uh, extracting. And I think that Mexico is the only country, uh, except for the state of Nevada in the United States, that does not charge any kind of royalty for the extraction of uh, minerals. Uh, so, uh, of ore. So, we believe uh, this is the situation that we have today, and the only way we think uh, we can solve our problems, and I think that we share uh, the same feelings with countries in the south and center of the continent, it is to change the economic, social, political development system that we have. We need to have a policy to grow our economy uh, with a an effective tax reform. Uh, in Mexico, we talk a lot about that, but it hasn't been accomplished yet, not to affect the interests of the large uh, capital groups. And we have to have a true industrialization policy and not uh, uh, just a makeup policy. And understand that fighting uh, crime and narco traffic is a must. And this is something that is extended throughout the country, controlling broader and broader portions of the territory by means of uh, threats and corruption to municipal governments. And so we have to understand that we cannot fight them just with the army, with the navy, or with uh, police-directed actions. We have to understand that this phenomenon has several implications, and we have to approach it from different ways. We have to talk about uh, the development of formal jobs, uh, of our welfare system, education, health care, and etc. Otherwise, in our case, we will not solve things. And deep down, deep down, what is really uh, marking us in reality, uh, the way to find a way to the problems of the country is uh, to really address our political, legislative issues, our foreign relations, and to fight to resume our national sovereignty that is practically disappeared and is now exhausted by powers and interests that are alien to our country, including in, uh, coming from areas outside our national borders. So I think that uh, we have talked a lot about that. Minister Vilpen mentioned this, uh, Professor Chomsky as well. We are really advocating to change the way we face the problems we are having today and change what we call neoliberal policies. Thank you very much. Thanks for sharing with us 
the situation that you have in Mexico today, and that will change in December, right? As of December. Now I'm going to turn the floor to Luis Carlos Bessio Pereira. It is an honor to be in this panel. I'm going to talk the, no, yeah, no, this is much better, yes. I'm going to talk about the overall topic of this panel, progressives and neoliberalism in the world. So what is the theory I'm going to develop with you? I'm going to tell you the following. Neoliberalism, which is dominant, has been dominant in the world since the 1980s, failed. We all agree with that. However, the center left has no alternative. Um, the way I see it is not enough to criticize neoliberalism and inequalities that are produced by it and authoritarianism it's associated to. We all know that, and it's important that we remember this. However, what we have to do is that we have an alternative theory and an alternative economic policy that is adopted from that that is adopted by neoliberals. Uh, we have to have an alternative to the orthodox neoliberalism. And what we talk about is the post Keynesian theory, which I believe is a bit old, and it has uh, little identification with economic development and international relations and classical uh, develop them, developmentism, where you do not have a macroeconomy and you continue to believe that growth happens based on external savings, which I believe is a huge mistake. So this is the theory I want to defend today. What do we see that is going on? The uh, financial capitalism, the is in crisis in the United States, uh, in South America, in Africa, not in Asia, at least not in Eastern Asia. And the crisis is started was the very slow growth that we had in the 70s when we were still under a developmentism economic system. When I talk about development oriented, is something that I decided to, to um, broaden the concept. We do not have a word that is an alternative to economic liberalism, not in Brazil or in Spanish. Socialism is not an alternative to economic liberalism. Socialism is an alternative to capitalism. Social democracy is the closest that we have, but it is a political concept. And uh, liberalism is an economic concept. So I thought that would be reasonable to use as an alternative inside capitalism to neoliberalism developmentism for one reason to start developmentism what is developmentism is a very broad general concept it is an economic system in which the state intervenes moderately in economy especially in non-competitive sectors and in the macroeconomic sector so having the right prices and addressing the non-competitive segments of economy. Now, it is a broad concept that capitalism is started as developmentalist in the beginning. It's not what we learn because people tell us that uh, it was Adam Smith that uh, founded the economic theory. It's not true. It was before. People say that the UK and the US were always liberal, which is false. The Industrial Revolution happened in the second half of the 18th in amidst mercantilism. 
and England only opened up its economy in 1846, 70 years after Adam Smith's book was published. And so, on the other hand, and, and that is uh, that is true for the countries that uh, developed earlier, like France or Belgium, and it's true for European countries that developed later, um, like Germany, Italy, Spain. And it's also true for countries in the outskirts of our capitalism. First Japan, then other countries in Eastern Asia, then Brazil, Mexico, Chile, and Argentina. All of them had their industrial revolutions under the light of developmentalism. In the world, now liberalism only became dominant as of 1846. England now being taken as basis, even in the 30s, if you think of France as the basis of it. And it ended in 1929 with the Great Crash of 29, then the Great Depression. And then we had the New Deal, which is a second level of developmentalism in the United States. And in Europe, mainly, and a bit in the United States, we have the golden years of uh, uh, capitalism which was the second wave of developmentalism with major growth, reduction of inequalities, and almost complete elimination of economic crisis. There is a chart that was uh, developed by Horan and Heihart, uh, two very important uh, economists that study economic crisis, and they show the economic crisis of the 20th century. They are very high until the 1940s. Then from 40 to 80, you have no crisis. It is the Keynesian period. It's the second wave of developmentalism. And then as of the 80s, you start seeing crises are just popping up everywhere. In this capitalism, in crisis, we have to remember is uh, capitalism that adopted as its main strategy globalization, and it failed completely. It was not the United States that uh, won with uh, globalization, not even Europe as we thought it would be, uh, because they are wiser and, uh, than the rest of the world. It was China. It was East Asia, more specifically. Uh, but I would say China, most of all. And this is significant, and it posed a crisis to the rentist uh, capitalism. In Latin America, there was no development since the 80s. And uh, we see this malaise this ill-being in the whole of the world. And this ill-being is expressed by the growth of extreme populist uh, right-wing, uh, like Trump and Brexit, not only, but others uh, in other countries. Even Brazil now has a case of extreme right with some possibility of uh, a, good amount of votes, which is tragic. And while this crisis is going on throughout the world, uh, this crisis in neoliberalism that started in 2008, which was a major crisis, and then in 2016, which was the political crisis of neoliberalism and globalization. In 16, because this is the year Trump was elected and Brexit was voted. In Brazil and in Latin America, the elites and its brilliant economists is still, you know, defend ferociously neoliberalism and more reforms, although these reforms failed everywhere else. So that means, does that mean that democracy is threatened in Latin America, in the world? Well, I will disagree. I think what happened is that there was a deterioration in the quality of democracy. But to think that 
we will have uh, rich or middle-income uh, countries like Brazil to authoritarianism. Well, I don't believe that. I think these countries already have working classes that are well organized. They have a vast middle class that they do not want and will not accept authoritarianism. They will accept a parliament coup, as we had in Brazil with President Dilma uh, Rousseff. And Uh, uh, the Brazilians that voted for her. But it's differently than having a coup and having a dictatorship and staying for 30 years uh, just uh, uh, seizing all political and civil, civil rights. I do not think this is going to happen. But the quality of democracy is much worse. It is impressive. The American democracy, the quality of American democracy is very, very poor today. I studied in the States in 60, 61. The society was coercive. Uh, democracy was uh, alive. Today, the United States is a society that is completely torn. And democracy has deteriorated uh, uh, a lot, with all due respect to the voters of the United States. And so we are going through a period with this capitalism that is only good for Eastern Asian countries. It's not good for Western countries. It's a bit okay for Eastern European countries, especially Poland and Hungary. And perhaps, what do you call it? Slovakia and the Czech Republic. But uh, for the rest of the world, uh, the growth rates are very, very low. Even Germany that imposed a crisis to Southern Europe has very low growth rates. The US has very low growth rates. So what happened in the society? Why is it that after 30 golden years of capitalism, it all went away? And what we have now, instead of social democracy coalition or uh, the Fordist coalition, as the, the French uh, school says, uh, everything was abandoned. And now we dove into neoliberalism. And we have been there since the 80s. And why? Because there was a crisis in the 70s, a decrease in profit rates, but a modest crisis, nothing like the crisis of the 20s and nothing like what we saw in 2008. But still, it was enough for the golden years of capitalism went away. or went down the drain. And why did it happen? Well, even before that, I have to tell you why we had the golden years of capitalism. We had the golden years of capitalism because uh, the failure of the 30s, the failure of neoliberalism, the upsurge of a new theory, Keynesianism, which was very important, and the upsurge of a second economic theory, which is classical uh, Latin American extractualism, the classical developmentalism, and Fordism, or the golden years of capitalism. There is a coalition of classes that was very broad, that included not only workers and employers, but a broad middle class. Everybody gained, salaries went up with productivity, so everything seems to work uh, quite seamlessly. And why did it end all of a sudden? Well, first, the crease of Bretton Woods. All this Canadian system of the golden years was based on the Bretton Woods Agreement of 1944 that organized the world economy. And Bretton Woods was rejected by the US in 1971 when they left the golden standard. Uh, the convertibility of deficit into uh, gold. 
And that happened because the whole Bretton Woods system was based on the idea that uh, the United States would have an eternal surplus. And they thought that they could have internal deficit in their current accounts. And that was good because that would increase consumption, presidents would be reelected, and because they could uh, just uh, issue money, dollars, everything was fixed. And so they left the gold standard and started to have very high deficits in their current accounts. And that dismantled the whole system and created a deep instability after in the post Bretton Woods period. Another thing that originated neoliberalism is the competition from the Asian tigers. And Brazil and Mexico along as of the 70s in the exporting on manufacturing goods. That should not be underestimated. This is part of the crisis. In the 70s, that seemed petty, and it was, but it was enough to bother the North. And since the 90s with China, well, then things uh, became uh, very, very strong. And finally, in the 70s, then you had somewhat of a crisis. Keynesianism um, proved to be incapable of settling or solving the crisis. So these are the causes for things to collapse. But why neoliberalism? Well, first, neoliberalism is an alternative to developmentalism. Um, the World Bank was the birth of developmentalist economists in the world. Sepal was the center of developmentalism in the United Nations. And that, as of the 80s, changed everything. The World Bank became an agent of neoliberal moves. Sepal lost completely contact with uh, national development. And the first reason is that this was the alternative. But why was it the alternative? Who likes liberalism that much? Well, you know who likes liberalism is the new rentier financial coalition that took over the world as of the 80s. People talk about financial capitalism. I don't like the expression because that's from Hilton, a Marxist from the beginning of the uh, 20th uh, century that wrote a book on financial capital, which was the merger of capital and industrial uh, capital which was happening in Germany, but it didn't even move on in Germany, uh, not in other countries. But there was a huge increase of power of the financial system. And this financial system being captured by banks and other financial institutions. So what happened? In my view, what happened was that there were two crucial changes in capitalism, uh, the way I see it. So the capitalism that we have had since the 20th century is a technical bureaucratic capitalism. It's no longer the liberal classical capitalism of the 19th century. Uh, we have a third class, a managerial class, that shares uh, privileges and privileges uh, and powers, I'm sorry, with the bourgeois. And this class, uh, I worked with them in the 70s, they replaced entrepreneurs in managing major corporations. So what happened in the second half of the 20th century is that uh, these entrepreneurs were now replaced by rentier in the propriety of their companies. And who are the rentier capitalisms? The heirs and speculators that you have throughout the world. That is, people who do not work, that live out of income. Now, you can ask me, 
Why is it just after the second half of the 20th century that we started to have a venture capitalism? I think the burning of capital that before was performed by means of major wars or major depressions uh, were over. The last Great Depression was in the 30s, the last World War ended in 45, and after that we had no more. So this brutal process of accumulation of capital nonstop is not destroyed. Well, some of it is when you have a fall in interest rates, but not as you had before. And then there is an excess of capital that belongs to rentier capitalism. And they are completely incompetent people. Idle, as aristocracy was in the past. And you know who they hired? They hired financial people to manage their wealth. And financial people are very intelligent. They are bright. They are technical bureaucrats. Um, they were trained in the best MBAs. They have the best PhDs in economics. And their role is to manage the wealth of rentier capital. And the second mission is what? To be the organic intellectuals of ranchers. They are no longer lawyers, philosophers that are the intellectuals of the bourgeois. Now it is the economists, neoclassic and neoliberal economists. Because neoclassical theory is nothing other than a pseudo scientific justification of neoliberalism. So, of course, this kind of economic liberalism is very attractive to these rentiers, very attractive to the financiers. And there's another element that is a curious one. So could it be that these economists are only concerned about reaping the benefits of serving the rentier elites it's not only that. There's another element which is important, which is the pla Platonism. What does that mean? There's nothing that, int that attracts intellectuals more than anything is reason. And the neoclassical theories developed a theory which is reason itself a model that is totally hypothetical, deductive, based on axioms that has no d direct relationship with reality, and that doesn't matter, but it's a pretty sight. And it can all be expressed mathematically. So, so financial rentier capitalism is the capitalism. It's a second stage of the techno-bureaucratic capitalism. It's a capitalism that associates rentiers and financiers. Is a capitalism where there's a process of financialization. In other words, the brutal increase in the fictitious capital, isn't it, Marilena? So, On the other hand, something must be thought through. How is it that this financial rentier capitalism and neoliberal dominate the world? It's no longer directly by force. F force is still used. We see it. Iraq, Syria, Libya, Latin America, until very recently, they haven't. But all, all they haven't done this for a while staged coups, but all this is secondary. Ever since the end of colonialism in the post-war period, imperialism ceased to work with force fundamentally. What is the main mechanism? Is ideological hegemony. It's soft power. And that's the fundamental point. And it's a ideological hegemony that rests basically on the US university system and neoclassical thought that has taken over political science and even sociology, which I think is absurd, but they do manage to um, 
pass themselves off in the sociology departments with their empty thought. So, and the investments made in this in the ideological hegemony is major. And all of this results at the start of my presentation from a capitalist economy that grows very little, that is very unstable, that concentrates wealth everywhere except in the countries that, that did not fall into the trap, which are the East Asian countries. And how to change all this? I don't know how, but what I can tell you is the following is that it's no use trying to change if you don't have an, an economic alternative to organize the system. If you simply change and say, now we're going to distribute wealth, that by itself does not work. You need a, a system, a theory that you're basing things on. I always say that there are two types of intellectuals that are very important on the left. The critical intellectuals and the governing intellectuals. We need both. I don't know where Marilena is. Marilena did an amazing presentation that was critical. We also need the construction. When we see left-wing politicians get to power and being forced or feeling forced to put uh, in the in the central bank or in the Ministry of Finance, totally orthodox economists. That shows how much our economic alternatives are not well defined. So we need to demand of ourselves and of our economists an alternative in this regard. An instigating talk, Professor. Thank you. Carlos Ominami, please, Chilean Senator. Thank you. I want to say a special thank you for the invitation from Celso and the Pestel Abramo Foundation. I want to say that I'm really honored to be able to share this panel and to speak at this seminar. I also feel very much uh, at home to be able to see a lot of friends and brothers and sisters from other so many struggles. There are two absences. One, of course, is President Lula's absence. It has been said here, it's almost common sense to say that he is the most important political leader of modern Brazil. I would say more. is the most important leader of progressive uh, camp globally. There were two in the past, Nelson Mandela and President Lula. With, with Mandela's death, there's only President Lula left as the main figure. And I would say because of this, precisely because of this, for his leadership in Brazil and globally, they've tried to destroy him. And it's very emotional to say that today they have not managed. Today, Lula is bigger than yesterday. So Lula has grown in the hearts of Brazilian people and Democrats all over the world. There's a second absence, a friend, a brother, comrade, Marco Aurelio Garcia de Almeida. Of course, he, we miss him. We, need, we, would, we would need him. So we're witnessing enormous regression in Latin America in terms of integration. And so we miss Celso Morin and President Lula to be able to take up again this effort of integration of our countries. So what the, the, the question that was given to us was the threats to democracy. and the issue of progressivism and neoliberalism. So just a, a, a couple of words about the general question. The threats to democracy exist and are very serious. And Brazil 
is a good example of that. Marco Aurelio said this in the past and very correct. What happened in Brazil with Dilma's uh, unseating in 2016 is probably the most serious thing that happened in Latin America since the coup against Salvador Allende in 1973. It's not the same kind of coup, of course. It's like a, a, a soft coup. It's a, a, a slow camera coup, but it's a coup. So very important things are at stake in Brazil. I want to uh, talk about leaders from abroad who are here, Jose Luis Zapatero, Massimo D'Alema, President Lagos, President Bachelet, High Commissioner for Human Rights currently, President Hollande, Coltemo Cárdenas, Bernie Sanders, Martin Schulz, and let's say things as they are, even the Pope Francis. I would say so I was a few weeks ago I, I met him is the most lucid consequential person than some of our own leaders so the panel in the morning talked about the international setting dominated by neoliberal uh, domination and I take what was said in the morning as my starting point so progressivism and neoliberalism in a world in development so I want to very briefly uh, talk about four points in my talk the consequences of neoliberalism second something more important which is a definition of neoliberalism so sometimes we talk about it in proper terms and sometimes not so proper terms. So I want to talk about the pertinence of the concept of progressivism and, le and the left and for very quickly to try to be humbly to be uh, a sort of a recipe for a progressivism of the 21st century. I think neoliberalism has had a very deep mark marks in the world, in our countries in recent decades. Not even Friedman or Thatcher or Reagan imagined that they were going to end up having so much success when they started this uh, revolution of neoliberalism. So if we look at what happened with neoliberalism, we can see that it is almost a sort of single thought in economic terms. It penetrated deep in the field of the political center and even, to be self-critical, of the left. The examples are many. Financial deregulation of President Clinton, the, the, the President Hollande's uh, labor reforms, the labor reforms in Italy. So in the, in the case of Chile is no exception with progressive governments, neoliberal aspects to the program. And I want to be very humble and respectful here. What happened in economic terms during the second government of President Rousseff. I believe neoliberalism is also responding like the crisis of 2008, they didn't pay the political price. It brought about cultural changes. Many of our countries, there is uh, an individualistic culture that reigns, that rules. Everything that has to do with community, with solidarity bonds have been weakened. So. To push for neoliberalism, there was a there was a, a push for globalization and also the decay of social democracy. 
the results in France and Italy, in Germany, countries with strong socialist and social democratic political forces. The recent election results show this very well. And I believe one of the main and most serious inheritances is this neoliberalism, this anti-political uh, slogan. This ended up helping the far right, not just in Europe and in some of our countries here in Latin America as well. That's my first point, a sort of inventory of what has been the neoliberal predominant predominance in recent decades. But it's important to ask ourselves about what it is exactly, that uh, what neoliberalism is exactly. What, it's not the opening of the economies to the world. It's not also a macroeconomic rigor. Of course, we have to be rigorous macroeconomically, but the question is how do you do this? So we mustn't confuse neoliberalism with market economy. Neoliberalism is an extreme variant of the market economy. As Madalena explained very well this morning, it's a market fundamentalism. It's a totalitarianism of the market. So a focus where everything must be mercantilized with a business entrepreneurial logic. What does this lead to? It leads to the, to the elimination of the border between market economy and econ market economy and market society. So we start going from a market economy, which is something that is consistent, coherent with the democratic system, towards a society of the market, a market society where things that necessarily need to be public assets become privatized. Uh, Professor Blesa Pereira explained this very well. There's a theory. The basic theory is that the process of growth and development, the main factor is capital. Capital is more important than labor. That's the idea. Everything that comes later is coherent with that idea. So if capital is more important than labor, so you have to privatize companies. You have to create spaces for the development of capital. If you believe that capital is the most important factor, you have to lower taxes. Let them pay the lowest taxes possible to have more possibilities for growth. Mm -hmm. If we believe that capital is more important than labor, we have to limit unions, fight, combat unions, because they are an obstacle to the capitalist development. So by intending to be the only thought, what neoliberalism is doing at the end of the day is to inhibit a democratic deliberation, to hamper democratic deliberation. And because of this, demonizing the state, it ends up causing a lot of damage to politics. If the economy, neoliberal economy, is, uh, rises to the status of, of an exact science, of a natural science, like a scientific thing, in Chile they used to talk about the Chicago boys. So those that didn't believe in, econ in, in neoliberal economics, we were, called, we were called apprentices. We were not holders of this scientific knowledge. I think that is a huge damage to politics. It's important to define with a certain amount of rigor what is neoliberalism. It's not the market economy. It's an extreme, extreme variant. So my third point, progressivism and the left. I have a discussion with many friends that tell me correctly that this uh, idea of progressivism can bring in everyone. It's an ambiguous expression. The left, it's a much more precise notion. I have, and I say this very humbly, that this broader notion of progressivism can yield much more than the notion of left. I'll try to explain. 
nobody can deny the fact that the left has historically an enormous merit and a lot of space to this day in the fight, in the, in the fight against social inequality. That's the natural space of the left. And when people say in the 21st century there's no more meaning to being right or left, I would say 99.9% .9 of people who say that are right wing. The point is, is that it's not enough. Fight ag fighting against inequalities in the current world. There are other challenges that the traditional left find it much more difficult to deal with these challenges, I feel. There's a challenge regarding democracy. The traditional left, in many aspects, have a certain authoritarian tradition, more vertical tradition. They are less horizontal than the current world. The traditional left, let's be frank, because of their tra traditions are very often sexist. They are not especially uh, comfortable uh, confronting the challenges of gender liberation in the country today. I feel part of a more productivist uh, tradition and where the ecological, environmental questions we were not terribly comfortable with. We find it difficult to incorporate them fully. The traditional left have a certain tendency to be more nationalist, to feel in certain cases uncomfortable with the processes of opening and globalization, and we are more statist. There are important challenges in the fields of innovation and entrepreneurship. So I feel, therefore, as a consequence of all this, that with all its ambiguities, the notion of progressivism uh, has to be built taking on these challenges. It can be a more inclusive notion than the idea of the tradition of the left as took place as existed in the 19th and 20th century. I think this is a discussion that is on the table, and progressivism could reduce, could not, cannot be reduced to a sort of light left. That, you know, uh, um, files away, that sandpapers away its more pointed edges. <laughs> so to speak. So there are many challenges, the democratic challenge, the gender challenge, the innovation challenge, the ecological challenge, these are on the table for us. We cannot be just a sort of light left. So as time goes by and I discuss with friends, I feel that a progressive force with aspirations, important aspirations, should be at least radically democratic. Uh, secular, socially oriented, uh, societal, not statist, developmentalist in the sense of Professor Bressa Pereira, but also green, feminist, open to the world, innovative, and transparent. Thank you. Okay, now we are going to our last uh, talk, uh, Minister Zapatero. Thank you very much. I thank the Fundação for the invite and to be able to references. Una a Cuauhtémoc Cárdenas. El apellido Cárdenas es un apellido querido en España. Querido en España. Paso muchos días por, por una plaza en Madrid que lleva el nombre de tu padre. Su padre fue presidente de México, como saben. 
y fue un presidente que abrió los brazos al exilio español generosamente y para ello siempre contará con los agradecimientos de los españoles y muy especialmente de los españoles republicanos. Gracias. Lo digo por este, este momento histórico en el que muchos de los países quieren levantar muros. Parece que el gran problema es que haya gente que quiere ir a compartir un, una pequeña parte del destino de su riqueza, huyendo de la miseria, del hambre. Pues quizá recordar los momentos históricos de América Latina. Pueden sentirse orgullosos lo que hizo con España. Pienso en México, pero también pienso en Argentina. Está aquí nuestro amigo Tallán. Y otros muchos países que acogieron a españoles y a muchos europeos del exilio político por las dictaduras o del exilio económico. Y América Latina se hizo más grande con ellos y ellos y nosotros nos hicimos mucho más grandes con América Latina. Esta es mi primera consideración. Y recuperar, por tanto, el, el valor que tiene esa visión universal, cosmopolita, abierta, solidaria. Has the view of solidarity that wrote the best pages of history of humankind. Pages that are in the Constitution, in the Universal Declaration of Rights, in the Declaration of Workers, that open doors to the rights of workers that are in the composition of organizations that put an end to slavery in history and that always had a global cosmopolitan view. I am happy to be amongst the members of the left of the Workers' Party and particularly motivated because you are in the midst of an electoral campaign. It has started, correct? And this is a decisive uh, electoral campaign for Brazil, for Latin America, and for the global order. I always thought that a country is not what it believes it is, but the identity of uh, a country is, and even our individual identities, is how people see ourselves. And Brazil is a decisive reference for Latin America the Brazil of President Lula, the Brazil of democracy, the Brazil of hope, left three decisive legacies in the world order. One, well, never before had anyone been as strong opposing world poverty and hunger as Lula the objectives of sustainable development, the objectives to eradicate extreme poverty and death would not exist without President Lula. My generation may be very well the first to get to know the end of child mortality because of hunger in the world. And the contribution of Lula and Brazil was decisive. As it was for the awareness of sustainable development and strategic views, putting together BRICS in a multilateral order, an order that would be new and different, that opened to the world as a consequence of globalization. I went from here to send my trust and my gratitude to President Lula da Silva. And remember, and remind you all what President Lula said in one of the demonstrations. I received uh, the book of the Hope Caravans, and one who says, I am not 
the only Lula in Brazil. There are many Lulas around. And now we have to show that. You have to show all humanitarians, all Brazilians, the progressive Brazil that will not admit that democracy is in the hand of the most powerful. A Brazil that does not admit that institutions are forced to be managed by those that do not have empathy for others, people who do not accept uh, people with different colors or that come from a humble origin. Far from being a situation in the whole of uh, the world, I got to know President Lula. We were together for seven years ahead of our countries. I know he wants to see you strong, focusing on the electoral victory, a victory that will change things. And the first thing a man from the left has to do is never lose trust in him herself, him her values, and to know that democracy is always a struggle for democracy. It, we are going through difficult times, but we've been through worse times before here in Brazil and also in the history of my countries. And being aware of that is very important. I am optimistic despite the scenario. I know I will hold Lula in my arms. And I know that I will do that with the president of the Workers' Party in Brazil. I am optimistic with all my due respect. I don't feel that we were defeated by neoliberalism whatsoever. And besides, I believe the values that the left represents, civil rights, individual, social rights, gained the battle in history. Is it a linear battle? Of course it's not. Are there setbacks? Uh, do we go backwards? Yes. In democracy, we cannot win the elections all the time. That's impossible. Even the Swedish socialists lost in life. Of course, it's part of the game. And you know that when this happens, and it happens uh, sometimes, uh, then it will happen also to the right. Now, if you think of the line of progress in history, think of most countries, including those uh, that uh, um, fate was very, very unfavorable. And I believe that the line in history is of progress, of conquering, of accomplishment of rights. There are times of stagnation. There are times we move backwards. It's true. We are going through uncertainties. The cries of 2008 provoked an economic political tsunami. It's true. But we would not be correct if we, went, we didn't see things right. What is the basis of uh, the crisis? Someone in the panel said it was China, the Asian countries going into the world economy scenario. And they started to occupy a space that until then was concentrated with the US and Europe only with 16% of the economy in the 70s. They had more than 50% of the world GDP. China came up. But remember, in the 1850s, the first power of the world was China. 
And when China started to change and started to occupy the markets, when it started to sell cheaper, when it started to produce as much as the most technically advanced economies, it changed the game completely. And then there was a huge indebtedness of the Western world, the United States that have a record debt and Europe as well to keep its level of welfare with an aging population, indebtedness to keep an economy that can no longer be maintained. For all those reasons, we had these new regulations. In addition to the financial system and the elite getting richer, But let's not uh, be mistaken, behind problems of economy, behind uh, the workers in the industry, uh, in the states of Ohio, Pennsylvania, that voted for Trump because uh, their industrial plants were dismantled. And then we had the power of the merging countries. That put an end to a fairer division of the world. Uh, the world could not be dominated by Europe and the United States alone. And it will take time. It will take time until China and the Chinese population demand levels of well-being that are similar to those of developed countries. And they will. They will demand rights in their jobs, in health, in education, in pension. They will demand the essentials, the basics that Europe were able to accomplish and that Latin America and Brazil managed also to accomplish when Lula was president. So let's have this in mind. I think it is essential to have a good analytical capacity. It was said that new liberal elites and elites in the financial system have agents of thought that are brilliant. Well, left-wing parties should also have think tanks work in networks, and we should have a major organization, a major network of organization of think tanks of leftist parties, because in the end of the day, the battle of ideas is the main battle to be fought, the battle of ideas. In the beginning, the left uh, ten has to be a leader. we still have to digest the consequences of what happened. And it will take time. But I want to, to make reference to something that I believe is essential for the left and that we cannot lose sight of. This is an exercise of humbleness that we have to have. The left and politics in general. We have to pay much more attention to the impact of the technological exchanges. I have to admit, I have an intellectual diet. I don't know who did more for a model of free market or extension of globalization in the free trade, if it was Thatcher or the internet. Reagan or the invention of the container, which was something that uh, was of utmost importance for the development of the world. Sometimes I think that internet in history is going to be more important than Thatcher. And therefore, we have to have this exercise of humbleness and understand that things Sometimes it seems difficult. We are in the middle of uh, a crisis. We see the frailties of a systemic, of a political system. And uh, we think that technology is going to give us the safety that is going to help us in the direction of our actions. And then something happens which is unpredictable and everything collapses. 
but see, we, no one is asking what uh, think tanks are going to provoke in the political system in the future. We are still digesting what the social media represents in conventional democracy. I uh, ruled uh, without the social media, and I wonder, uh, I don't even have Twitter or a Facebook account. Now, being a president now in the world of Twitter is, you know, is to run the risk of having a heart attack all the time. It's a permanent uh, status of uh, anxiety. And, you know, Twitter is something that is just the fruit of uh, a greater development of inter internet. But let's be positive. This technological revolution Uh, is different. The life expectancy of my grandfather in Spain uh, was about 40 years old. My daughters will probably live until 110, 120 years old, thanks to technological advances. This will also lead to problems, of course. But in the end of the day, if we think as from the Industrial Revolution and as from the birth of leftist movements, the first, the second, the third international, the other day, Professor Chomsky asked in a debate, oh, we were talking. And we would say, what would Karl Marx think of this moment if he lived now uh, and were in a country like Sweden, Spain, uh, that have almost 50% of its wealth from taxes? And everything comes from the redistribution of these taxes. What uh, Karl Marx would think of a country like Spain that was originally very poor and which any citizen, any uh, inhabitant uh, from, I don't know, even from Senegal that is sick in Spain can be an illegal dweller but without papers but to still be seen by the public health system. Although this treatment can cost one million euros or one million dollars. As uh, the president of the richest bank in Spain is going to be treated exactly the same way. I wondered what would Karl Marx think uh, of universal health care. I know that in the U.S. it doesn't happen. The middle class is just saving all they can to have good life insurance. But in Spain, I must say, a modest social democracy, there we're able to have universal health care with one of the best public health care systems in the world. And as we succeeded this, we also succeeded in having social mobility by means of education. We are the most feminist country. We have the administration with the largest number of women in the world. And we know that when we had the financial crisis and, and uh, the effects of the crisis did not lead to an evolution of the right. Quite the opposite. It was an evolution of the left. And that was very important. And this is seen in the new parliament, people who are critical and that are in government with us. The right, of course, did take power after the crisis as well. But uh, Most of the cultural hegemony is progressive, and this is important, and we have to reinforce those values. We have to have a strong ideological discourses to advocate for the levels, the ideas of equality and the left. And this is what Brazil has to do in Latin America, a continent that is going through such difficult times after the hope and all integration processes that the continent went through. It's true that everything that was done before 
is quite dismantled. The center of this de-articulation is a country I dedicated my last three years in life, which is Venezuela. Of course, someday we may talk about this, about Chile, for instance, and what went on there and also about what happened with other countries, other governments. Venezuela was a laboratory of how many things happened in the continent, Brazil and Venezuela. If we are imposing a specific solution for conflicts or not, if we open the door to a non-Pacific solution. And that's why I think of Brazil and Venezuela. And I think you are going to relate to that. If this continent of this uh, region that is still quite young and is so rich in natural resources, resources with which it will make a difference for the world development in the next decades. And this region has been through major changes in education, undoubtedly, and in the reduction of inequalities. Of course, it should be even more intensive that this continent interprets globalization. It has a progressive views and it is part of the integration system. Without integration, without cooperation, without the union of states, sovereignty is no longer what it was, and it will never be what it was in a global world that no one can hold. We have to be very modest intellectually and we have to understand that no one will stop migratory movements or globalization. They will just intensify because humankind will not give away its capacity to communicate at every level. In 1950s, there were 50 million tourists in the world. It is more than 1 billion today. And the numbers just grow. Transportation is going to be faster. Communications are going to be faster. Everything is going to be faster. We are not going to give away this. As we did not give away the Industrial Revolution and the upsurge of television, of radio, and this will change politics. Of course it will. But politics is apolitical. We do not have old or new politics. We have different means of communication, and therefore we have a different way to communicate ourselves politically. But the major ideas are here. Since the times of Greece, as architecture, you have the Baroque, Gothic, uh, colonial, several styles. But but architecture has common grounds, how to build a building for it not to collapse. And the same applies to politics. You have the aspiration of ideas to do things and make men and women freer and fairer, because this is the history of political struggle. Politics has to be to the side of left. It is the right that do not like politics. Franco would tell uh, his ministers, do not mess around with politics. The right does not like politics. And we know it is the leverage of change. It always yields results in 100% of times. I'm not saying that there are not errors that are not uh, going backwards. Of course there are, but we are interested in democracy. We want our citizens to believe that democracy, that the institutions will last 
and that they are socially believable. And this is our task, as Professor Marilena said this morning. And therefore, we have to have democratic values and respect for democracy, the rules for transparency in place. These are essential pillars for a left project. And we have to have a pacifist view. I ask you to do all you can for October to be a peaceful month and that you're going to open a door in Brazil. I would like to tell all Brazilian citizens that there are many, many people who are politically responsible, who we trust in Brazil. We saw Brazil live its best moments in history just a few years ago. And Brazil is a country of reference in the world. And this is important for Latin America, the idea of peace. Whenever I see a country is going through severe problems, I come close to it. I want to help. I don't want to put an end to the country. I don't want to intervene. But I want just to outreach, to lead my hand, not to give them lessons, not to demand anything from them. Because first, you have to be optimistic. You have to be open to cooperate. You have to come in peace. You have to come willing to establish a dialogue, willing to be patient. These are the best values of the left. Patience, contention, control. These are values of the left. And I believe it is incredible to see so many politicians that raised their voices against Venezuela but were silent when they saw what, what happened with the impeachment in Brazil. But it has come the time to measure things. You know, democracy is a system that gets better when we have no heroes, no martins. A good democracy is a democracy we do not have to resort to heroes or martyrs. And in the end of the day, this is a cultural issue. It has to do with education and culture. We need our countries to grow and develop and they will only grow economically with more culture, more education. We have to gain the right with ideas, and we will only have these ideas with culture and education. We have to, settle, to set examples. We cannot uh, just get back to them with the same weapons. We have to set the example that we are better at all levels. This is what should, should be deeply rooted in society. And you may rest assured that you have uh, the support, the solidarity, and sympathy of me, of my country, of uh, my party, and also millions of men and women in Europe and in Latin America. And I know that you will win these elections. Fernando is going to be the president. I am convinced of that. And it's going to be victory. Uh, that is going to be generous uh, against all odds. Give this lesson. Give this example. Sometimes instinctively, we want to do something else. But give the example, the lesson of generosity and say that to the whole of Latin America. Do not believe that uh, because there were many governments from the left and then fewer, and now the history is going back to Mexico. But the right cannot uh, detain the progress of humankind. They can break some processes. They may slow down, but they cannot really break this chain. 
what happened in Latin America from the 2000 to today was amazing. The right always thought that uh, the left would never leave this, con this continent. But without a social coalition, we do not have feasible societies. We do not uh, have a future if society is unbearable. And this is what the elites have to understand. It is important. I always say what happens in Venezuela, generally on my way from the airport of Makatia to Caracas. It is a one hour journey. You have to go up 1,000 meters up where Caracas is located, and you go up and up and up until by the road, and you have some hills around where you have shanty towns. 1.5 million people who live in these areas. Even in the richest periods of Venezuela, when it was the third power, largest power in the world, with the peak of the first wave of oil in the country. We all know the fortunes that we have in Venezuela. And after decades and decades, poverty remained. And that explained what happened in the Fourth and Fifth Republic. Of course, I always uh, carry on discussions with uh, Chavistas. I always say I have a mission to tell them things and make them understand things. But how come that one of the richest countries of the world is amidst this conflict, this crisis? How could the Western international community and the American countries decide to seek for the implosion of this country? How is it possible? This will be something that we are going to still reflect in history. I am an annoying witness, but I talk about these countries that are now concerned with the immigrants that are coming to their frontiers, like Brazil and other countries. You had, uh, you know, the sanctions that basically blocked uh, uh, Venezuela from the U.S. Treasury. And you see the relationship that there is with this and the migration of so many Venezuelans. You may think whatever you want from the Maduro administration. Um, uh, you can be quite critical, but it is an injustice that these sanctions are being paid by the people. It is really a huge injustice. And if anyone thinks that this makes it possible for us to have a process of dialogue, well, this person is completely wrong. And I hope after the next elections in Brazil, Venezuela can count on the help of Brazil to change what uh, is being tried there, not only there, but in other countries. Uh, I think that this message is something I disagree ideologically because I am a pacifist, but because I think also it is absolutely useless. And I hope we can contribute in letting people know about. I am very happy to be here. Keep optimistic. Keep optimistic, because 
the values of the left were the values that changed the destiny of millions and millions, and that enabled the slavery that lived with uh, democracy. We should not forget that in European countries is just a bad memory in history. Uh, 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 I, perhaps the only wrong thing about left is that if there is something really liberating is to end with the discrimination, the greatest discrimination that we had in history, which was the discrimination against women. The only thing that I can see in all continents, all religions, all economic movements is not to think that gender equality is essential, and it is. When you have more equality between men and women, you have better positive discrimination policies, women have better places in society, and society is fairer because societies have to have the value of equality and non-discrimination. As in the Pennsylvania Declaration, the Declaration of Independence, um, which said our democracy will not admit any superiority of any kind. Let's have our democracy not to admit any superiority. I will remember something, an old Republic lady told me she was almost 90 years old. She had gone through a dictatorship times. She had gone through repression. And she told me, I do not give up, she said. I do not give up, ever. And do that. Do not give up, ever. You will win at some point. Thank you so much. Wow. It's 5.20 now. I would like to consult uh, the audience. I know it's instigating. So can we go another hour with the questions, or do you need a break? Shall we advance? Shall we press on? Shall we soldier on? If you really, really need, please do it discreetly. So now we thought maybe to go for another hour, which would be enough for about six people to make their comments and questions, and then return to our speakers. Okay, so we have two or two people who have already uh, asked to speak, and then we have four more slots free. So we begin with Professor Emir Sadir. In the first row, microphone for Emir, please. Thank you. Three brief remarks. Okay, the first is the name, progressivism, etc. We have to be clear that capitalism. Uh, uh, d is dressed in neoliberalism. So the left of the 21st century is the anti-neoliberal left. That is the main. Uh, s that is the main question. So we can say anti-neoliberal if we like. I don't think we are at the ground zero about alt economic alternatives. Otherwise, the Workers' Party governments, which would not would not have word which would not have been successful. So the Workers' Party governments, we are not at ground zero. The, the, we have a, an economic and social policy in one. So the key uh, dispute of our time is ideological, is about values. So how a certain idea 
a set of ideas imposes itself and then gets translated into election victories. So the American way of life is the ideological uh, predominant uh, idea regarding Marx. I sent an, a Twitter and I'm asking for a reply. I want to reaffirm you, thank you for your vigorous left-wing uh, speech that yes, we're going to win, that in October the, the spring will be red in Brazil. Thank you very much. Thank you, Emir, for being succinct. Let's speak at most, most, most for five minutes. Now, Walter Poma. Okay, three brief comments. The first, Professor Bresser said that he doesn't think that democracy is under threat, doesn't believe in a return to authoritarian regime. How many people here that imagine that we would be experiencing what we are experiencing today, actually? And what was the contribution, the idea that never again this would happen? What was the contribution? So I would prefer to work with this notion that in the right wing in Brazil, there are sectors that are willing to stage a military coup if necessary, because to have clarity about that is a condition for us to prevent that from happening. So that's my first remark. The second is about what Ominami said, which is the idea of progressivism that can yield more than the notion of left. I want to go back to what was said in the morning. Jorge Tayana said that without the welfare state, there's no basis for democracy, for liberal democracy. But he could have said as well that without working class, organized working class, socialist movement and the left, there would have been no, no democracy or welfare state. So I think honestly that the dilution of everything of the, about the meaning of the left in the jail of the progressivism does not help one or the other, in fact. So in this sense, in this regard, I agree with something that Bresse said on this aspect, that only this one. We're here to debate, not to agree necessarily. Yes, just this one. He said, I disagree with Emir, that there is the lack of a building of an, an alternative overarching view. And this overarching view, we need to demarcate the field from the ideological point of view and not to fall into generalities. So to demarcate a left-wing camp is necessary. So progressivism is too vague to be able to carry out that function, not to mention that politically it is also necessary to demarcate the field. So third remark, in the list of all the things in the Ominami said that progressives and the left have to be, and I don't disagree with anything, there's one thing that draws my attention, non-statist. If he means that society has to be self-organized, I agree. If it means that we have to have uh, uh, changes from the bottom up, I agree once again. But that's as far as it goes, because without the state, there won't be development. Okay? Thank you, Walter. Paulo Marianti. We will take an, uh, uh, three more after Paulo. I'm from ABGLT, the LGBT Association of Brazil. Regarding the state, as Walter said, in dialogue with Ominami, it doesn't seem to me that the state is an ideal model for our organization. But we have great difficulty imagining that without a process through the state, changing the state to something different, more democratic, that serves the majorities, that it is possible to do without it. I think that's something that we need to clarify, because in terms of defending the rights of women, LGBT community, black people, so many other excluded population, the state can be an instrument, not just the state, correct, but not but we can't yield on the role of the state. 
Regar regarding the LGBT movement, there are many, there's much, many, many questionings. There, are much, there is much questioning because the left not always has been able to have a dialogue with us. There are sectors of the left said that homosexuality was as a perversion or an illness, and this is a way to criminalize us, we feel. So these questions of gender, of diversity, of ethnicity and race, are they or are they not strategic for a project of transformation with the name of left pro progressivism? It doesn't matter. I like, I prefer left, but nevertheless, I think this is something that need, we would need to clarify. The mic on the, right there. Ivan Gonzalez is from TUCA, the Trade Union Confederation of the Americas and the International Council for the Freedom of Lula. Thank you, President Zapatero, for talking about Venezuela. I'm Venezuela, and I thank you for your words, your clarity in terms of separating the, the things, because we can have criticism of uh, President Maduro, of course. It's Venezuelans that have to decide who as their president, just much as Brazilians and Paraguayans and whoever they elect. But the question is, what is the contribution of the left and of Democrats in Latin America and the world in the sense of stopping the aggression, the imperialist aggression, which is being built against Venezuela under a discourse of humanitarian crisis, human rights to justify an aggression, which would be worse for the situation of Venezuelan people. So what should be Brazilian Democrats expect a change, but Democrats of the world in the sense of having a position with regards to the aggression of US imperialism against Venezuela and thus threatening peace in Latin America. Okay, going once, going twice. Okay, no more um, questions will be taken. So now each of the speakers has about seven minutes or so, and then at the end of this round, we have the closing speech from Minister Celso Amorim and from the Pessoa Brahma Foundation representative. Okay, so in the opposite order, beginning with Zapatero. Thank you very much. I just want to uh, talk about two issues that were raised. The first is the one that uh, about the LGTB movement representative. It seems to me to be crucial crucial, and this is the ideological debate from my point of view of what the left constitutes, and you put it very well. So the question centers on gender equality because that there is in the left uh, uh, sexist uh, features and homophobic as well. Among the left, that is present, yes. And these are two issues that are transformative, not just because it makes people happier. So justice and equality of gender is absolutely unquestionable. But also, there you form a society with pro-equality uh, values. So I want to mention very quickly what has been going on in Spain. My government was the first in the world to create the uh, marriage of people of the same sex and adoption for same-sex couples as well. The day it was approved, I said in Parliament that we wouldn't be the last, that there would be a tide in favor of equality against humiliation, against discrimination that had taken place. So somebody, some governments asked me, how is it possible that Spain, Catholic Spain, is the f most open country, most for homosexual couples, and gay pride marches are huge in Spain, of course, is the most tolerant country. I always explain 
that we left, we went into the debate with, without concessions, with the need to convince everyone about that, that we wanted the whole package, marriage and adoption. And some progressive governments even doubted us. It wasn't clear that there was a hegemony in society. So I insist, this is the same for, for gender equality and gender policies, uh, diversity policies in general. It's essential for a left-wing government can have, can be deeply rooted in society because these are social values that are embedded that you may even lose an election but you come back again afterwards. So this equality, these equality policies changed our countries. The history of humankind is not the history of the exploitation of man by man, as Marx said. Great phrase. The history of humankind is the exploitation of of women by men. That's the history of humankind. Who has suffered most discrimination? In every society, it's been women. So democracy for a long time did not uh, have votes for women. How can we have even called those things those systems democracies, if half the population couldn't vote, that's the greatest discrimination in history. That undergone by women. So the left is above all the, the, the political force that fights against discrimination, whether it's in the economic field, in the workplace, wherever. So civil rights, individual rights, so you form a society with a vocation for equality, vocation for equality in the face of the many inequalities. So, Venezuela now, of course. It's a lab. Uh, after three years, I still don't believe the obsession with, obs with Venezuela of so many powers of the world. It's really incredible. Maybe it's because of the wealth. Biggest oil reserves, oil, gold reserves, coltan, uh, diamonds. I don't know if that's the reason. But people who love Venezuela should love, should respect it. Those that love it should seek uh, agreement, dialogue, and not practice petty politics, that you're going to uh, win country votes in your country by attacking uh, Venezuela, uh, they are practicing petty politics. So when we see uh, barefoot uh, immig immig Venezuelan immigrants, when they ask you, what you did you do for me, despite this government or that government, we have to lead from the left, of course, a radical vision of a political, diplomatic, peaceful exit for the conflicts. This morning, it was said here, the terrible consequences of the Iraq war, for instance, the intervention in Libya. So the Middle East destroyed, destroyed. And the international community, if, one, if it doesn't want to solve the Palestinian problem and the formation of the Palestinian state, there will never be a Middle East with peace and stability, and we'll continue to see the growth of international terrorism. So that's the deep-seated problem, that the origin. So we need the Palestinian state. We are internationalists, and so we want to put our 
place our bets on globalization and peaceful solutions for 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 problems. And Latin America and Latin America has on its plate this question of Venezuela and the way the, the Venezuelan issue will be dealt with will be a mark for the whole continent. Of course, now with the Trump administration, the radicalism has become imposed in favor of this implosion, non-negotiated solution without any dialogue whatsoever. Sanctions, etc. But it won't work. It will not work. I can tell you that right now. We have to make sure that politics imposes itself, not strength, not force. That the vision of sitting down at the table opposite your greatest adversary, that has to prevail. We have to eradicate this idea of wanting to eliminate the other, eliminate those that don't think alike. That's politics, man. And the other part is anti-politics. So when there is politics, there could be advances and solutions. When there's anti-politics, there's only catastrophe and backwardness, regression. And the left is not just the ideological force that has to lead the economic response to social inequalities. That is the role, that is the DNA of the left, the fight in favor of the humble, in favor of reducing and fighting inequalities. I, I have the experience of government. Some responses uh, are of one brand or another. They're submitted to a million variables. It would be easy to say this is the plan and this is we follow it. Very often you need to conduct a, a ship and the, the, the tempest comes and you're not sure which way to, which path to, to take. But we have to have clarity about two things. And on this point I conclude that to reason economically is not, does not mean to conspire socially. I'm sure that President Lula shares this thought with me because we've already talked a lot about this. To reason economically does not mean to conspire socially. Second point, I believe that the left should incorporate the best democratic discourse. Never the end justifies the means, never. To give examples of democratic forms, democratic behaviors, seems to me to be essential. I know what it meant for many of you that President Lula could not be the candidate of the party. I know what you feel. And I put myself in your place. I try to. But you must. Uh, you must support your candidate in the hope of seeing Lula where he should be, because in that way you will be uh, rendering a great service to democracy. Even if you are not aware of this today, the historians will be, uh, will when they write this chapter of our history, they will know that you played a great role, you did a great service to the country. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister Zapatero. Now, Carlos Ominami. So very briefly, I want to say that, that I agree with Emil said that the left, progress, progressive or whatever, has to be radically democratic and radically anti-democratic. I have no doubt about that. But 
but again, again responding to Walter Poma, I believe in a left that promotes a strategy of development and an industrial policy, and that requires a strong state. When I said not statist, maybe I could be limiting what I meant to say, but what I want to say is that not all problems have solutions that come from the, from the top down that we have to open up space in society, but always it will be necessary to have a good protection, social protection system and a state that guarantees that. So I don't think we can be uh, ambiguous about that. I think the classic identity of the left must not be dissolved. Progressivism that I talk about has to be anchored in social movements, in the working class, but understanding at the same time that today we have a structure of the labor market that's very different. We have the digitalization of the economy. We have new employment realities that challenge d deeply the traditional action of the labor movement, of the unions. So we must never renounce the historical combat of the left, which is for social equality. And so the left is irreplaceable, what I'm saying. And this is what uh, Jose Luis said as well, the, the, the challenge of gender. But there's also the challenge of innovation. I have doubts about these things. If the traditional left is equipped in its current configuration to provide the most adequate uh, uh, responses, but I believe that that is an issue for debate. So I agree with Jose Luis about Venezuela. I think to talk about Venezuela today is difficult. The media campaign at global level has been frightful. Only it 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 is overcomes only the one that. Uh, uh, was done about Brazil. There are, uh, there are progressive leaders in Latin America, in Europe, that ask themselves, oh, is Lula guilty or not? People are actually asking themselves these questions. So the campaign taken forward by the major media that have for example, in Spain, Spain was very tough on Venezuela and Brazil, and for Argentina as well. And in this regard, our left and our leaders very often have not been able to resist. I share fully the effort made to seek out a, a peaceful solution to the Venezuelan uh, crisis. I have criticism of President Maduro, but I don't get lost along the way. So Chavez played the role that he played, and that didn't come down from heaven. He was the response for a, for a corrupt. He was the answer to a corrupt system, a system that did not work anymore in Venezuela. And what we have. There is a lot of coup plots that's been clearly demonstrated, that has been demonstrated on various occasions. There are sectors that are openly advocating military coups, intervention. That would be fatal if these sectors uh, were to be victorious. I want to conclude on a positive note, however. We are in September of 2018, one year ago. We were under the cloud of the, there was this thing, the progressive, the cycle of progressive governments in Latin America has ended, the nightmare has ended, and few of us were saying, modestly, I wrote a book saying, the title is uh, End of Cycle or Open Process, and I think it's clear that it's an open process. I hope, I honestly hope that Lopez Obrador 
is a successful president for, in Mexico, it's very important that he should be successful. Imagine if we could imagine Lopez Obrador with a majority in both houses of Congress or Fernando Haddad as president of Brazil. This would represent 70% of the population of Latin America with these two countries. This opens up a whole different picture. Macri, that was a, appeared as the main starlet of the neoconservatives in Latin America. Look what's happening to him. His government is unraveling. And his friend Piñera, he's doing a little better than Macri, but he's not somebody that has a, a bright future ahead. So. In a short period of time, in a year or so, things have changed for the better once again. We have reasons to be optimistic, and we have a lot of energy to fight. Thank you. And now we are going to have Professor Bresser. First, I have a word to Sader and Walter. I did not suggest that we should have a scale from zero ground. We have classical de developmentalism. Before that, we have Marx. So of course, we are not starting from scratch. But as Walter said it, we lack a view of the whole. A proposal that is macroeconomic and a larger economic policy for the left. Ideological domination of neoliberalism was strong. Now, I think it was very clear in this workshop, especially because our guests from abroad that is Lula's utmost importance in the world political scenario. One of them said that after Mandela, the crucial leader that we had in world left was Lula, and it is Lula, and this is very much important because he had a fantastic administration. This is a fact an administration in the left. And people ask, what is this uh, to be left? I have another definition of left that I added something to. Obviously, that uh, the left is critical of inequality, authoritarianism, imperialism, economic liberalism, or neoliberalism. It's critical of individualism, and therefore political liberalism as the individual. We are critical. For you to be in the left or from the left, you have to be critical. But you also have to be viscerally democratic. Democracy is an accomplishment of the people, not of the elite everywhere in the world. One third. Today we know that orders is the fundamental principle of societies. Now, the way I see it, you are only from the left if you're willing to risk the order on behalf of justice. It's not that you are abandoning order. If you are a revolutionary, you have to do that. But outside the revolution, if you are not willing to risk the order a bit and let the social process advance, if you want to keep the order at all costs, you will not advance. And therefore, you're not from the left. And finally, one thing that people generally demand from the left is that it has an international integration. Fernando Henrique Cardoso well, is a specialist to uh, just say that Brazil is closed, is a closed country, and it has to 
open internationally, integrate internationally. I don't think Brazil is an open, is a closed country, but I believe it has to integrate uh, internationally, but not like Fernando Henrique puts it. He wants a subordinate integration. I believe that we have to integrate as Celso Marin puts it, and as President Lula puts it, to integrate to the international scenario with solidarity and with competitiveness. So we have to have solidarity, but we also have to be competitive. All that said, the last thing I can say is the following. The challenge of the left throughout the world is to finally govern capitalism with more competence than capitalists. And it's not easy, but that's the challenge. We have to promote equalities, distribution, and that's not easy. It is a task that demands determination, courage, and luck. Thank you very much. To close this panel, uh, the final remarks of Professor Noam Chomsky. Well, uh, one of my defects is uh, that I don't hear very well. So I got a scattering of what was said. And towards the end, thanks to my wife Valeria's fixing this thing, I was able to hear. And uh, one of her many virtues is that she's Brazilian, uh, so uh, she's been able to keep me up to date on what's happening in Brazil uh, much better than I could find out uh, just from the international press. And she was also able to give me the gist while she was here of some of the comments I couldn't hear. Uh, I naturally uh, endorse what's generally been said generally about the mission of the left. We should be uh, uh, democratic, uh, open, uh, seeking uh, sustainable development, uh, other virtues. These are the tradition of the left. We should pursue them. Uh, many questions came up about the many comments, very good comments, about the role of the state and the way uh, the left can use the state as an instrument for progressive change, uh, assuming that it is a democratic state. And we should bear in mind that such uh, noble institutions as a democratic state barely exist. Uh, I talked about, uh, there's a lot of talk about the illiberal democracies of, the, of Eastern Europe true, very serious. But what about the liberal democracies of Western Europe? Well, as I mentioned, the liberal democracies of Western Europe uh, do not have fundamental socioeconomic decisions in the hands of the public. Uh, they have them in the hands of bureaucrats in, in Brussels, uh, unelected, uh, and northern banks. And there's plenty of suffering because of that. So for example, Greece is the striking case where uh, the Troika bureaucrats uh, employed what were called bailouts for Greece in order to bail out the northern banks using Greece as a funnel, uh, while Greece practically, for their improper uh, uh, lending, while Greece practically collapsed. Uh, I mentioned the United States, supposedly the epitome of democracy, where roughly 70% of the voters are totally unrepresented in that their own representatives pay absolutely no attention to their wishes, as is shown simply by comparing attitudes, which you know a lot about from extensive polling, uh, with uh, uh, choices made by the uh, representatives. In addition to that, uh, lobbying literally leads to uh, uh, writing of legislation. Uh, furthermore, elections are literally bought. It's a critical fact about American democracy. Very uh, 
effectively demonstrated by substantial research that you can predict uh, electability for Congress and president with remarkable precision simply by looking at campaign funding. And that's the bare beginning. Uh, international economists uh, sometimes describe the uh, international political economy as involving what they call a virtual parliament, a parliament of investors, and uh, w which consists of investors and owners of capital who, uh, who provide a second constituency for governments. One constituency is the public, who they don't pay much attention to. The second is the uh, a virtual parliament, who make uh, carry out uh, a moment-by-moment -moment analysis of policies. And if they don't like it, if they don't like policies, they have a variety of devices for undermining them. Uh, in Latin America, it's called corruption. Uh, in the United States, it's called legal. Uh, but it's not very different. Uh, devices like, for example, a capital flight. If you don't like a policy, you send your capital abroad, or you disinvest, or something. Uh, that's uh, you go to a tax haven. Uh, that's not that's called legal, uh, but it's uh, just another form of corruption which undermines the political system. Uh, when we talk about the role of the state, uh, we should recognize that. What are, what's called development is very in, in so-called market societies is very substantially the result of taxpayer subsidy. It's initially fundamental research and development. The risky stage of development, the costly risky stage, is typically borne by the taxpayer. You take a look at today's high-tech economy. Incidentally, this goes back to the the origins of uh, capitalist development in England in the 18th century all the way through. But just take the modern high-tech economy, uh, the internet, uh, computers, uh, satellites, uh, iPhones, uh, lasers, uh, and just take a careful look at where they came from. Overwhelmingly, it's long periods, decades of public uh, funding, public subsidy, uh, things like procurement by the government when industries like IBM make huge computers they can't sell, the government picks them up. Uh, the internet, for example, which many people mentioned, I happened to be initiated in a lab where I was, my, the lab where I was, in fact, in the late 50s by J.C. Licklider and others, uh, for, for about 30 years. It was uh, developed through uh, public subsidy, public funding. Finally, in around 1995, it was handed over to private enterprise to exploit. It's a gift from the public to private enterprise. Computers were developed from the early 50s uh, until the first computer that was marketable was Apple in 1977, the first one that could be sold for a profit. That's after about almost 40 years of uh, research and development by the public. Uh, we're supposed to have a capitalist economy. Uh, one of the principles of a capitalist economy is that if you invest uh, and make a risky, costly investment and ultimately it becomes profitable, you're supposed to get a return from the investment doesn't work like that in our society. The public pays, but it doesn't get any return. The public does not get a return when uh, Apple or Microsoft or others get uh, are able finally to market something that was created with public funding. You take a look, there's an economic historian, Maria Mazzucato, who analyzed, among other things, the iPhone. And it turns out just about every component of the iPhone traces back to long-term uh, public investment through the government. Uh, the, and this is only one of the many means by which we create a, what's called a market economy, which to a large extent is a, an economy of 
public subsidy and private profit over with long, extensive periods of public subsidy. There's no time to go into it, but that's pretty much the whole history of development, starting from 18th century England. Uh, can the state be used by a democratic public, a democratic, a democratic state be used by the public for a positive social change? Yes, of course, it's happened. In fact, the period of regimented capitalism, the golden age, the is a period in which that happened. And right now, there are many things that could be done. So, for example, the massive subsidies that are given to uh, major industries have no legitimacy, and they're very harmful. Uh, the, a good bit of talk about the growth of the financial institution, spectacular growth since the onset of the neoliberal programs in the 70s. It's mostly harmful to the economy. Uh, one of the reasons for it is it's publicly subsidized. I mentioned an IMF uh, study, one of many indications, that virtually the whole profit of uh, major financial institutions comes from a tacit government insurance policy, which the public pays for in all sorts of ways. Now, the energy corporations are massively subsidized hundreds of billions of dollars a year. And not only does that radically distort markets in favor of concentrated private capital, but it's also leading to the destruction of organized human life. Uh, it take, that's not a small point. Uh, anybody who's not living under a rock knows that we're in a period <coughs> of a impending existential crisis from global warming. Uh, the biggest bank in the world, uh, J.P. Morgan Chase, the major bank, uh, Jamie Dimon, very competent executive, uh, recently said that he could win the next election if he ran. Uh, one of the things that he's doing is uh, rapidly expanding investment in fossil fuels. Well, makes sense if you want to make short-term profit doesn't make any sense if you want human life to survive. And this is supported by government subsidies, which keep the banks functioning, uh, along with direct subsidies to the energy corporation. Now, take the subsidies to agribusiness. That's a very significant part of NAFTA. NAFTA is supposed to be a free trade agreement. That's the rhetoric. Uh, how are Mexican campesinos, no matter how efficient they are going to compete with highly subsidized U.S. agribusiness? Well, answer, they're not. And we see the consequences. They're driven off the land, can't survive. They try to come to Mexico, to the United States, stop the border, imprison the children or thrown in detention camps along with people fleeing from the wreckage of what the U.S. did in Central America in the 80s. Yeah, these are all things that the state does and doesn't have to do. Can, uh, or take, take the trade agreement, NAFTA, World Trade Organization, and so on. Uh, one of their essential components is, to pro is a highly protectionist subsidy to private corporations. Uh, one of the reasons why Bill Gates is the richest man in the world or close to it, is that uh, the trade agreements give Microsoft a monopoly, monopoly pricing rights. Uh, Gates is undoubtedly an intelligent person who did, had good ideas and so on. Uh, partially, he was able to exploit the research and development in the public sector on computers and software over many decades. Uh, partially, he's able to uh, rely on the uh, monopoly pricing rights that granted by the intellectual property, the intellectual property rights uh, components of the World Trade Organization, which are utterly exorbitant uh, patent rules. If they had been in place when the U.S. was a developing society, uh, the United States would be exporting uh, fish and fur right now, literally. Uh, all of these are parts of what the state does and doesn't have to do. 
uh, the, uh, there are many other possibilities. The public support for predatory institutions like the energy and financial institutions doesn't have to be there. Uh, a small financial transaction tax could radically reduce the harmful impact of financial institutions, very rapid trading and so on, uh, while at the same time providing b badly needed revenue. The uh, virtual Senate, the virtual parliament, doesn't have to exist. Uh, this there was considerable talk about Venezuela and Brazil, naturally. And if we look at them, they're, they illustrate this phenomenon. Uh, both Brazil and uh, Professor, Professor Herrera pointed out that Brazil had a fantastic administration, which is very true. It had remarkable uh, achievements. Now, that was actually true in Venezuela, too, under Chavez. There was radical reduction in poverty, sharp increase in educational opportunities. Uh, the government was highly popular. If you look at the, uh, you know, there's this major uh, polling organization based in Chile, Latino Barometro. You take a look at their results over the Chavez years. Uh, Venezuela was right next to Uruguay at the top of support for democracy and support for the government. Uh, there were flaws both in, there were problems both in Brazil and Venezuela, some of them external, some internal. Uh, as far as Venezuela was concerned, the virtual Senate was destructive. It hated uh, Venezuela's uh, uh, actions from the very beginning. There was a military coup supported by the United States. There was constant sabotage, massive capital flight, and so on. Uh, so, you know, uh, uh, strike, a uh, capital strike which closed down the major industry of oil. But there were also internal problems. Uh, one of the internal problems in both Brazil and, uh, and uh, uh, Venezuela was failure to diversify the economy. Uh, in Venezuela, the uh, reliance on oil remains about 95%. That's not, a, that's not a recipe for development. In Brazil, the, uh, the fact that China was, in Venezuela, was a matter of high oil prices when they collapsed, the economy collapsed. When, uh, in the case of Brazil, uh, China's absorption of massive primary products seriously di uh, distorted the Brazilian economy. It meant that there, the lack of development of manufacturing, first of all, because resources were placed elsewhere, secondly, because of the competition from artificially cheap uh, Chinese uh, uh, export, which is part of the development problem, a problem. Another problem in both countries was what's called corruption in Latin America, a feature of the electoral systems, uh, which was not terminated either by Chavez or by Lula, it went on, that's serious. As I said, in North America, it's not called corruption, but it happens at a massive scale. Those are serious problems. All of that has to be overcome, and there are many ways to do it. There are good, concrete suggestions about how to develop a sustainable, green economy. Now, there are uh, ideas partially implemented to try to change the government policy, I'm talking about the United States now particularly, of uh, requiring corporations to, to be based on uh, shareholder uh, profit. That doesn't have to be done. That's a government decision. Government corporations are government-created institutions. They follow the government law, uh, uh, design laws of, of governance. It's part of the neoliberal programs the Friedmanite idea that corporations have to work for shareholder profit, which means the profit of a very narrow sector of the population, uh, major banks, and so on. Uh, that's not a law of nature. That was instituted in the early 80s, and it's a large part of the reason for the rapid inequality, the, the explosion, as I mentioned, of CEO compensation by a 1,000%. It could be 
corporations could be dedicated to stakeholders, the community and the workforce, uh, to their benefit. Perfectly legitimate. In fact, you can go beyond that. Here we begin to think about significant reforms. Uh, go back to classical liberal ideas from John Locke to Adam Smith to Tom Paine, uh, all the way through to Abraham Lincoln and the 19th century Republican Party. Uh, one of their fundamental conceptions was that the right to work under your own control is an inalienable right, just as you, it's an inalienable right not to be a slave, it's an inalienable right not to be a wage laborer. This was actually a slogan of the Republican Party of the 19th century. It was regarded as so obvious. Uh, the wage labor was regarded as different from slavery only in that it was temporary until you become a free person again. Well, that crashed against the rise of industrialization. Uh, there's a reason why. And that you read Adam Smith, his examples, like a pin factory, uh, had uh, 10 employees. He you know, wasn't talking about an industrial economy, uh, but a, an economy basically of farmers, where people could then free themselves from the semi-slavery of wage labor. Uh, the inheritor of these classical liberal ideas is authentic socialism, not what's called socialism, meaning state control by a, a party leadership, not socialism. Socialism meant workers' control, producers' control over production as part of a general democratic society. That's an ideal that is not all that remote. Pieces of it are being constructed in the present society. Uh, that could be an ideal for the future. It would ultimately tend to dissolve the state into a real democratic state. I think these are all ideals that the left not only can have in mind, but can begin to implement in bits and pieces, following uh, actually Bakunin's advice to build the elements of a future society within the present one. So there's a whole spectrum of possibility, from things like a financial transaction tax to changing the rules of corporate government, eliminating subsidies, dropping the highly protectionist elements of the international trade agreements, all the way up to creating a true democratic society in which institutions are under actual public control, including the productive enterprises which should be developed and uh, working for a sustainable society which will enable the human species to survive the existential crisis that is facing us, which is a very dark shadow that, uh, uh, that casts uh, its gloom over uh, everything we discuss. Com a palavra do professor Chomsky, a gente conclui essa mesa que eu tive a honra de coordenar. Eu queria chamar. Remarks. I was honored to conclude chair this panel that I was honored to chair. Now I call upon Arthur Henrique and Celso Amorim to conclude. So, and on behalf of the board of the Perseu Abramo Foundation, Rosama, Arthur, Joaquim, Márcio Poshman, Vivi, Isabel, we want to say a special thank you, first of all, to our guests, our guest speakers from Brazil, and particularly those that came from abroad who travel far for long hours to be here among us sharing their day and exchanging these ideas. A special thank you to all our guests who came over the course of today from the board, all of you who were here from the International Relations uh, Group, the executive of the Workers' Party. So we want to 
on behalf of the Pesewa Burama Foundation to say thank you to you all and particularly to all the workers, all the staff of the Pesewa Burama Foundation who, after all, uh, devoted themselves uh, over the last few days to make sure that we could be here over the course of today uh, having such a, a great seminar successful as it was. A special thank you as well to those that assisted, to, who watched, forgive me, who watched over the internet, over the uh, social networks, and those who together with Villapan had the original idea, the, the creators of this uh, agenda for today. So President, uh, Minister uh, Celso Morin. Thank you all. I will not uh, uh, repeat Arthur's uh, uh, thank yous. Um, it was an immense pleasure to conduct a seminar such as this one. It was a major challenge to think about the possibility of people not coming. It's great because these are people who are busy. These are people who are uh, in demand, so to speak, and to have, as we do, have Noam Chomsky, perhaps the the intellectual of our generation, activist, activist intellectual who's best known in the world, highly requested, in demand globally. I think uh, the applause that President Ch that Professor Chomsky received when he entered the room were very significant in that regard. Three former heads of government from Europe two Social Democrats as Massimo D'Alem. I want to say indirectly that he, he also has an important role because Massimo, we were thinking about doing something different before things got so much worse here in Brazil, which was a seminar, which was a continuation, would have been a continuation of our discussion of progressive solutions for modern crises that we started uh, with, with our brothers from Chile, with the foundation, uh, the European Foundation of Progressive Parties, maybe we will continue that as well. So, Villepin, as I mentioned, a man who came from the Republican right from of France, but perhaps from the point of view of international politics has a very progressive viewpoint, not just international politics, but of the things that need to be do within countries. Well, it would be Bresse who He's already, he already left, but he was minister of the Fernando Henrique government, of the Sarney government, showing the plurality of origins here, but with a convergence of concerns uh, in the current uh, difficult setting in our country. I'll just make two remarks, and then I'll conclude. One of them uh, comes out of the words of José Luis Zapatero regarding his identity, and this is valid for people from the different countries, is not you that defines, it's others that define. And the presence of people here today demonstrates more than any word that can be said the importance that Brazil has in the world and the importance that Brazilian democracy has for democracy globally. And I think that is the essence of the, our seminar. And the other remark, uh, obviously there were two mm, uh, major absences, President Lula and Marco Aurelio Garcia, who died recently, an extraordinary comrade who, um, who was a major source of inspiration for all of us, for the policy making of the Workers' Party and all the Brazilian left. But I think we cannot fail to mention, which is the power of President Lula, of bringing to people together, even in prison, he, he was the one that actually put everyone together here. So, Lula Livre, free Lula. And I think this is very important. I want to, just for our guests from abroad, to reflect a little bit about an aspect, which is very a very graphic aspect of this whole situation. How is it possible that a, a provincial capital of a prison in Brazil is more visited by international uh, personalities than the presidential palace. Something is wrong and we must correct it.